Welcome to this day two of the online AGM. We know the situation is getting very complicated, uh, especially in Europe. New announcements every day and, and everyone's a bit focused on other items. So thank you for still taking the time for our network. So we're together during these three days to think collectively on what long-term consequences the ongoing crisis will have on our food cities around the world. Yesterday, we had a first keynote by Carolyn Steele, who brought us back in time to understand how our food cities were built. And through our discussion, we managed to see some positive coming out of what our societies are going through today. And so today is an opportunity for us to reconnect with what feeds us every day and to give again value to what we eat. Um, so that was yesterday and this afternoon, we will be looking at another very essential aspect of our ongoing situation, which is the gastronomy sector. The people who make our food cities tasty, enjoyable and attractive. That industry is being hit hard all around the world. And I know all of you are putting a lot of efforts in trying to support them. So today we will talk about the disruption and evolution of this sector. And I'm very happy to welcome our keynote uh, for this afternoon. Based in the Netherlands, Hans Steenbergen has his eyes, ears, and palate around the world. He is a trend watcher specialized in food and has interviewed hundreds of chefs and food entrepreneurs around the globe. Hans is the co-founder of the Food Inspiration magazine that most of you must know and follow. He's also a published author and advisor for many food companies. So although Hans is facing the same travel constraints as we, as we all are, his great knowledge on the food industry allows him to see the trends one step ahead. So we asked Hans to give us his perspective on what the future of the industry could look like. By anticipating the shift in the industry and in the consumer behavior, our food cities can better adapt and prepare for the future. So with Hans, it's time for the big reset. And I'm very happy to leave the floor to Hans, who will well, be you sharing his expertise. Please um, place all of your questions through the chat. Um, as we go, Gabrielle and I will be collecting them and asking them to Hans at the end. So thank you very much. And Hans, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you for having me over. Even if it, is li it isn't live, it's, it's only digital, but perhaps next time we can uh, meet each other in person. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about disruption of COVID-19, of course, but also about evolution. And I'm going to end my presentation with uh, the architecture in uh, our view of, uh, let's say, a great food experience. Um, but first, an introduction of uh, me and uh, my team. So this is me. Uh, I studied language, culture, philosophy, literature. I started working in uh, journalism uh, for television, radio, and I became finally an, uh, an editor in chief for a trade magazine and restaurants and hotels. And in 2009 and 2008, we started our own company, Food Inspiration, which is in fact a company which love to inspire the professionals in food and uh, hospitality. And we do that through different uh, uh, channels. And this is our team. We work a lot with uh, millennials. We're here having a great lunch at uh, Ponte Vecchio in uh, Florence. So we like to travel a lot also, uh, especially in pre-COVID times, of course. But now we're grounded too, uh, just like uh, you guys. So, uh, and these are the events we like to organize. So we have digital magazines, uh, as Camille said, but we have also other things like uh, conferences, like this one, this is the Food Inspiration Days. And one of the characteristics of these conferences is really that we, that we like to uh, think uh, out of the box. We like to inspire people. And to, to inspire people really means you got to get them out of their uh, comfort zone and, um, and, and to, to offer them that multi-sensory experience also during conferences. So this is what we do. I like to energize the crowd, you know, and people are having fun. That's also important. So I will try that, to do that now in a digital way. Let's see if that uh, works too. For example, this is a three-star Michelin chef from Holland, Joni Boer and his wife, Therese. We invited him several times during our Food Inspiration Day. And we'll ask them, can you present to us the very DNA of Holland to the crowd? And he invented 
a, a joint, yes, an edible three-star Michelin joint, which we enjoyed with 600 people at the same time. Now talking about creating memories, creating incredible memories through food, that's one to remember. Or this kind of food we also have served is strictly legal. It's Holland, you know, we're a bit out of the box, but it's strictly legal. It's strawberry powder. And that's another way to, uh, you know, to consume a dessert. So that's what we do. We're also part of a think tank, which is the Google Food Lab. And here we, we think with scientists all over the world and food producers and chefs and farmers about the future of our food system and how we can build a more resilient one and a more healthy and sustainable food system. I'm going to talk, of course, a little bit about that topic too. So that's us. We uh, like to travel around the world to collect our memories and our inspirations and talk to innovative entrepreneurs and chefs who uh, are uh, imagining a better future in food than it is right now. Because we have our challenges at this very moment, as you can imagine. Because this is what's happening. This is what's happening. We're all in fear. And every consumer, but also every entrepreneur, has huge challenges, especially entrepreneurs in food service, restaurateurs and hoteliers, because we have fear of contamination. And we have fear of contact, personal contact. We don't want to touch each other anymore. Uh, we have fear for meeting. So uh, the social distancing is, is, is one and a half meter or two meter, but sometimes it, it looks like a kilometer or, or, or a galaxy away. Uh, we have uh, a fear for the other one, and we have fear for going out. So our public life, our cultural life in many countries is uh, shut down. And uh, that's a terrible thing uh, to, to witness, in fact. And a lot of companies are struggling to find their way out, uh, out of this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And what you see right now, all the elements I just presented is, 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 is so against the essence of our world of food and hospitality, which is to connect people and, and, and to love people and to look them into the eyes on the table, having a great meal and, and really to share, you know, your thoughts, your feelings and create great memories. And that's something we don't have at this very moment, but there is optimism too, because it will return. Of course, it's an essential need for mankind to share each other's life through meals. All right. But we're going, because of COVID-19, from high touch to a low touch uh, society, uh, we say. And what is that? Well, this is the image of the consumer. It, it, uh, you know, afraid for every experiment, uh, not want to go out, uh, stay in home, uh, fear for other people. And that has uh, uh, several disruptions for uh, our food industry. And I'm going to mention a couple of them. Seven disruptions I see, we see, in the world of food and hospitality. So the first one is from out of home to staying in. Eh? What we see, of course, is that food retail is growing. Food service is in decline and struggling. Home consumption is growing and the economy around nightlife is uh, shrinking in a lot of countries. Eating out and having a drink at home is on the rise and home delivery is, of course, growing. And we working more from home, more lunch at home. And company catering is down and party catering is also in serious uh, decline. Another one, um, disruption is, is from distant uh, uh, lands to living uh, local. We fly less for the time being. Eh? No far away destinations anymore. Staycation, as we call it, is a big trend. Uh, a serious decline of international visitors. We're also realizing that food systems need to become more resilient. Ingredients from far away are falling out of favor. People endorse things that support your locals, uh, local entrepreneurs. And that's important because the farm to table movement is under serious pressure because restaurants are in lockdown and are open with uh, certain restrictions. So there is a, a huge uh, trend transition to uh, the local markets and the home markets. And this is the picture. So we're flying cargo instead of people at this uh, very moment. Another one, there's a third one from mass appeal to modest needs. What, what, what do we mean with that? Well, there are no large groups anymore. No festivals, no big company parties and conferences, no fairs, no public in stadiums. 
And we have to celebrate our life in small circles, in our own niche, whether or not digitally connected as we do right now. Another one is from city to back country. Uh, the city lacks uh, foreign tourists, as you might uh, notice. Many hotels and food service establishments are struggling for survival. And for the first time in a decade, we see residents moving out of cities like uh, New York, Amsterdam, and San Francisco. And people are looking for more space and more nature because the natural world is safe. And we're also questioning uh, the impact of mass tourism. So perhaps this is also an opportunity to reinvent tourism. Uh, do regions want to return to this kind of mass tourism with a big impact on, uh, on people and on cities and on environments? Or are we in favor of a, an, an, another kind of tourism, a more quality driven uh, tourism? And meanwhile, hotels in the region, by the way, and in the countryside are thriving. Another thing is we see from high touch to high tech. So due to Corona to COVID-19, there is an interference and noise in the, in the hospitality experience, you can say. And the feeling of discomfort and insecurity is difficult to massage away with, uh, now let's say, remote hospitality. And maximizing, maximizing added value through personal attention is very complicated at this very moment. So what we see is that a lot of routines in hospitality are digitized. Uh, you think online ordering and QR codes and delivery and contact like the payment. And these are things uh, to stay, of course. Another big trend, another big disruption because of COVID-19 is from indoors to outdoors. Uh, indoor dining is perceived uh, still uh, as unsafe, especially all the generations are scared to do that. So outside dining is a serious option for restaurateurs and hoteliers to survive. Winter terraces are becoming more important and heaters and blankets and pillows and depending of course on your climate zone are uh, becoming uh, yeah, a, a natural way of, uh, of going out. Um, we see the last one and that's from dining to delivery. So because of COVID-19 there's an uh, accelerated movement from bricks to clicks. Restaurants choose uh, omni-channel not just a revenue stream of dining in, but also to do takeout and delivery to become more resilient to uh, future shocks, shocks in the system. Food retail is of course investing heavily in selling convenience meals. Uh, those opportunities arise due to the restrictions in the, the restaurant uh, industry. We see a strong emergence of dark kitchens, restaurant labels with no indoor dining, and just cooking for uh, delivery. Okay, these are the seven important, uh, well, disruptions uh, we see in our world of food uh, service. And, but there is also uh, evolution. Uh, beside the disruptions, there are massive, well, developments, you can say, going on, um, despite of COVID-19. And we see three major trends. Uh, in society, which will uh, have a long lasting uh, impact, we think, on how we work, how we eat, and what we think is the true value. Um, I'm going to explain that one. So three major developments, uh, which are not at this very moment in sight, because all the news and all the panic around COVID-19, but on the background, these developments will reoccur the moment we have a vaccine or a, a, or a medicine. Perhaps you recognize uh, this picture. Huh? It's raised to your parents or grandparents, perhaps. And what we see is clear gender roles. That uh, man is uh, the provider. His wife takes care of the household. A clear uh, division, perhaps, between uh, work time and uh, personal time, uh, between formal and informal roles. And there's also a big chance that the children will be following their father's and mother's uh, footsteps. So how things have changed the last 50 years, perhaps in one or two generations, because this is the video of a young family. Eh? Uh, we, we are permanently now and everywhere available. Work has become uh, non-local, as we say. Eh? Daily rhythms become fluid. Eating moments vary. The separation between work and uh, private life 
is uh, not there anymore between week and weekend and work and vacation is all more or less yeah disappearing and there is a you know a renowned sociologist his name is Sigmund Baumann he died in 2017 after a very fruitful uh, life of almost 100 years and he writes about this transition and you, you've seen it correctly he, he's talking about a, a transition from a solid to a liquid modernity so solid reality gave a security with uh, institutions and we trusted and solid uh, career paths and long-term love affairs and fluid modernity on the other hand offers temporary career roles episodes of experiences and and, and also uncertainty about the future so the new consumer is therefore flexible uh, he or she likes to uh, improvise change his plan uh, quickly decides as the last minute uh, but also looks for meaning and, and guidance in, uh, in, in, in changing moments. So he longs for episodes in a day where he has control over his fluid life uh, that is constantly under stress by the sheer amount of choices, uh, choices he or she faces. And I think a food moment compensates for the permanent fear of missing out that uh, millennials and Generation Z are suffering from. So that transition from, from solid to fluid is, 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 you could say, the architecture of society and markets is it's changing and perhaps it's, it's melting. Eh? Now that work and private life overlap uh, with the growth of technological possibilities, we see the hotel, restaurant, bar, leisure and food retail also changing. Eh? Formulas and concepts are stretched to unburden uh, the working professional. Yeah, with this fluid daily routine. So, for example, think about hotel lobbies uh, uh, turning into social spaces where you can meet, work and eat with locals and visitors uh, together. And I think about the blurring between food retail and uh, food service, where in food markets you're not only buy groceries, but also can join a great meal. And think about shared spaces for global nomads, for example, and uh, the people who uh, uh, have a workplace on their uh, computer uh, where they can work without having their own office. So that's another important um, a, a big trend which we see from, from, from solid to a fluid modernity and how the industry is responding to those new consumer uh, wishes. Another one is of course uh, this one, Planet B. And uh, let's start with, uh, with, with something special. And, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm 61 already, yeah. And I was, let's say, I was born in 1959. And I have seen on television live this moment I'm going to show you. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, that's Mr. Neil Armstrong, of course. The first man who, ste who stepped on the moon. And that's incredible. Because this picture, which was taken, by the way, by uh, Apollo 8, uh, this picture is a symbol for the great awareness. And it, it initiated by, by space travel. Uh, it started with uh, 1968. The photo you see here is Earthrise. And it was the first space mission to orbit the moon. And it's almost 51 years ago. And when humanity saw that picture, this photo, we became aware, in fact, that we have only uh, one planet, one planet only. And Mother Earth is a closed system with a, a finite supply of uh, raw materials. And if we consume the supply, we will not have a planet B, a planet B. And, and, and this lady, this young girl started two years ago with telling us at the age of 15, she was there. Uh, that we're not aware enough, that we are not aware enough, we're not doing anything fast enough. And Greta Thunberg is an inspiration for the new generation, and she's now everywhere. In every city of the world, there is a Greta Thunberg already. And she's telling us, we have to change. This will be the decade of climate action, and our action in these upcoming, you, know, you can say, a new roaring 20s will be decisive of the future of our planet and how we want to live.
And otherwise also this planet is also going from solid to fluid. And that's not something to look forward to, is it? To put it mildly. So the message to baby boomers, especially who are still in power, Greta is telling us, well, we messed up and you're not a part of the solution. You're a part of the problem and that's gotta change. Otherwise we've got these kind of monuments in Iceland, for example, quite a cynical monument. It's put there in 2019 and Ock is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. And in the next 200 years, all the glaciers of Iceland will follow the same path. That's not something to look forward to. So you could say that it was simple in the old days in catering and food service. There was a world on the plate in the old days, and there was a world outside of the plate. And those two had little to do with each other. What was on the plate had to be tasty, and ethics didn't play an important role. But we're changing. We're changing because of new insights. Because the world outside the plate began to interfere with the food on the plate. Is it sustainable? Where is it from? Is it fresh? Does it come from a factory? Is it processed? What about additives? How many food mile? How many waste? How is it made? Is it healthy? Are you taking allergies and calories into account? Do you cook planet friendly? What about organic, vegetarian, local, paleo, vegan, raw? You name it. And whether we find it bothersome or not, the culinary naivety of the past is no longer possible. We as food industry are held accountable. Is our menu, our menu, not only good for our personal health, but also for our planetary health, eh? obesity, loss of biodiversity, global warming, companies, consumers, and governments, and institutions like UF are no longer closing their eyes to the negative consequences. And the crystal clear message is our production and consumption pattern must change and become part of the solution. Okay, that's the second one. So that's the second major development which is going on in our society. And the third one is about uh, from linear to circular, we call it. We have to rethink our economy. Uh, we started to think linearly, um, then we were less concerned about the consequences. You know, plastic soup, global warming, decline in biodiversity, soil depletion, all the problems we are facing. As far as we knew, it's a kind of collateral damage and the generation after us can solve those problems. We are not confronted with the consequences in our life because we think linear. And our belief in progress ensures that we will find smart solutions to all these problems in the future. Well, that's not the case anymore because in the coming years, innovative entrepreneurs will move from linear to circular. Circular business models, from economic to ecological, from, in fact, me and ego to us, to we. And all trends that are a reflection of this unifying realization will have the wind in their sails for the next 10 years. That's our belief. So that's why no waste will be one of the big topics, of course. And these are the trends we collect over the last 10 years in all the major cities. It's around about 80 uh, developments we uh, have analyzed and uh, talked about and presented. And, uh, but circularity eh, is, is a very important one and will be a carrier of new business models. And reciprocity with the local community will become an hygiene factor. And companies that ignore this powerful narrative uh, or act too late on it are put in a uh, defensive uh, position. Okay. Okay, so these are the, 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 the big developments. And now I want to talk to you about, uh, let's say, how we, uh, with the information we just presented to you, uh, build an architecture of a great uh, food experience. Because that's the thing I want to talk to you about. And we call that the food love pyramid. Well, you know, it's inspired, of course, by the famous uh, Maslow period. It's an, uh, well, a reflection, our model of uh, the values and attributes uh, ascribed to uh, food. It's also an evolutionary path that the society can uh, walk on the way for a healthy and uh, sustainable food culture. So, so this is Maslow. And of, of course, there's an extra bottom layer nowadays. 
without uh, people don't function anymore. Uh, and you can imagine that one. But we, we use that model to, 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 yeah, to, to build uh, and better understand what a great food experience is. And that's our food love uh, uh, model. But first, following up observation before I come to our food love model. And this is this one. It's a simple one, but it took me, well, it took me a lot of years to, uh, to, to, to realize and write it down. And a simple explanation is it why our food system is in growing parts of the world, perhaps broken or poor designed. You can call it also in that way. And that is, uh, that is this observation. Uh, we think that food has important values. And well, you all agree with me because you're all in, the, in working in the food space and doing great jobs for your cities. Uh, around the world. So that's great. But because of the price of food is so low, especially in Western countries, those values are not in the food anymore. And that's a huge problem. Because we designed a food system which is, uh, which is poor. Okay, so the food love pyramid, inspired by Maslow. And the bottom layer is, you probably uh, know that one, and there's energy, food safety, food security. Food is fuel here. At the bottom of the pyramid, food serves no purpose other than providing fuel for your body to function. It's important, of course, but without them, we won't function. But we were so successful the last, let's say, after World War II in Europe uh, with building a, a great food system that um, there are a lot of, you know, impact uh, impact now, which, which was not anticipated, not expected. Because this is uh, our, our image, the final result in the end. Supermarkets stuffed with ultra-processed foods and cheap calories, and food also with too much sugar and, and fat and, and, and salt. And this is the agricultural system uh, behind it, mirroring more or less the picture you just saw uh, from a supermarket. So monoculture with an environmental impact because of our strong appetite for meat in a lot of uh, developed countries uh, and which has a great impact on the environment. Okay, now it's time to, uh, to, uh, to quote uh, a, a, a great uh, writer. Um, our eating pattern has changed over the last 50 uh, years more than in 10,000 uh, years before, and that's Michael Pollan. You probably uh, know the guy, of course, he's very famous in our food space. And this is an observation which is very true, very true. And I had time for some fun, a great experience to uh, demonstrate what he is uh, talking about. So I was in Vegas, probably, uh, you know the city, and there are some great restaurants over there, but there is one restaurant which is a uh, a special story and I was there and, and I took a little video of my uh, food experience and that's the heart attack grill, heart attack grill. I don't know if you heard about it, but um, everybody who is uh, heavier than 350 pounds is, uh, is uh, entitled to have a free uh, meal. So that's their payoff more or less. Eh? And they're fighting uh, anorexia uh, uh, for more than years with success. That's another payoff. And, and more, it's, it's such an interesting story, but because it's a metaphor for me, how, uh, let's say, our food system works in a bad way. Yeah. So I was there in a heart attack grill. I was treated like a patient, and I, I did the ultimate challenge. I ordered uh, not a bypass burger, you know, the bypass burger, they sell bypass burgers, but and not a double one. I, 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 I did go all the way, all the way. And let's see what I what I had. Here's the video. Okay, uh, hier ga je een beetje van schrikken. Want waar ik nu ben, ik ben in Las Vegas. En wel in een heel bijzonder uh, hamburger concept. En dat heet de Heart Attack uh, Grill. Uh, de, de, ik, ben, ik, 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 ik kwam hier binnen en ik, en ik werd ineens als een patiënt behandeld. Dus ik heb dit uh, om me gekregen. En de bedienend personeel, dat zijn uh, zusters, die mij uh, uit de droom gaan helpen. Want dit concept is in alle opzichten volstrekt fout, fout, fout. En ik krijg zo het hoogtepunt van de menukaart, want die heb ik besteld. En dat is een quadruple double bypass hamburger van 8000 kilocalorieën. En dat ga ik laten zien. Wow, boys. Moet eens kijken naar de friet hier. Moet eens kijken. Zeg bruin en slap en zo en zo vet. 
Nou, als je dan dit zou eten, dan maak je er reclame voor, dat is 8000 kilocalorieën. Dit is onvoorstelbaar, hè? Dat ze dit verzinnen. Ik, ik moet dit opeten. Dan ben je een week, dus voor een week genoeg. Wauw. Nou, dit heeft dus niks meer met uh, duurzaamheid te maken. Dit heeft ook niks met uh, gezondheid te maken. Maar eigenlijk alles wat fout is, gewoon goed maken. En uh, uh, ik zit even te kijken hoe je dit moet eten trouwens. Want uh, dan moet je eventjes... Uh, wat voor een ding zeg. <laughs> dit valt ook niet. <laughs> dit is, ja, ik weet, ik zal... Uh, Jezus. <laughs> don't try this at home. <coughs> And don't tell my children. <laughs> this is the result, of course. Uh, it's not only America with a pandemic of uh, obesity, uh, which is uh, much more worse than COVID-19, in fact. Uh, it's also Mexico and other parts of the world, which uh, is a fear of which has our serious struggle. Of because of our bad menus and bad food choices, and we have to change uh, our menu. And I think restaurateurs can play a, a vital role, but otherwise we end up uh, like this. And well, and that's not the evolution of our eating behavior uh, we want, do we? Okay, important. So what is the next level of this uh, food to love pyramid? Uh, we're going to build a little bit in uh, value and taste. And, and because of what we just saw, the re reaction is, of course, health. We need healthy food. Food as die medicine. And that's the second level of the pyramid. Food evolved from mere nutrition to means of uh, healing and cleansing. Uh, food for a specific category of foodies serves almost as internal cosmetics. Internal cosmetics, we call it. Food will keep you in shape, healthy, enables me to be at my best now and in the future. And that's why we see uh, this big uh, movement as the protein flip. Of course, a more, more plant-based uh, plant menus, plant-forward dining. And that's an expression for this longing of uh, healthy food. And now during our travels, in every major city where we went, uh, you see new concepts who are selling healthy products in, an, in a very, uh, attractive way, products which are delicious and nutritious. All right, the next level. What will the next level be in our view? And that's origin and ethics. As I explained earlier, what's on your plate reflects what's happening uh, in the world. So there's a strong relationship between plate and planet and we're getting better at understanding that the world is a closed system with finite uh, resources. And we see, uh, and we feel a lot of people feel that everything in the world is uh, connected. So the choice of what we eat on this level of the food loaf pyramid is the key perhaps to a better world. The sustainable plant forward dining is one of the most important answers to this planet wide challenge. And these are uh, the books, eh? the selection of recent books and thinkers and writers you probably know or perhaps have read pioneering authors who are leading us and paving the way uh, the last decade to that uh, new future. And transparency and telling true stories are becoming more and more important. So to support honest narratives, for example, is a huge responsibility. And that's also an important task, we think, for food marketeers and storytellers. We have to build attractive narratives to support the food people of good wealth because that's important. Okay, the fourth layer, what will that be? That will be, in our view, identity and lifestyle. Food has become a lifestyle. Foodies are willing to wait half an hour for a cup of coffee made by that one barista or using that one blend. Uh, and status or status is no longer uh, the car you drive, but uh, the food choices you make the restaurant you visit. We think that food is permanent um, on the catwalk. Uh, the dinner table is perhaps the catwalk of uh, good taste. And we did a photo shoot 
And especially those younger generations, millennials and Gen Z, who are into food and have a different view to food. And we did a photo shoot with millennials uh, a couple of years ago. And we asked them, if you are what you eat, uh, can you show me who you are? And this is what they shared with us. Incredible, beautiful pictures of their vulnerability and, 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 and their beauty and their relationship uh, between them and, and the food. So I am what I eat, said Dennis. And, and or local organic healthy, says uh, Elma at the age of 22. And, and it told us that the new generation will, will, will lead us to that better food culture we need. Interesting, but it's not the only thing. It also has to be in the eyes of the new generation, Instagrammable. And the old days word of mouth was enough to uh, build an important uh, fan base around your restaurant or farm or perhaps even a city. And now it's about sharing pictures on uh, social uh, media. And food is one of the most uh, popular items, things people uh, share. Food is on the catwalk. And that's why we see these kind of dishes made almost by artists uh, where uh, they want to seduce to you with the beauty and the color and the tastings. Uh, food has become so important that perhaps a camera is, is, is a tool just as important as a fork or, or knife in a restaurant. And, and we, I have a great video which shows how important food is and the beauty of food. And look what happens when young people notice that a photo opportunity is ruined just for fun. Look at this little video. Bush. <laughs> Oh. Mush. What are you doing? <laughs> right, no, you go yeah, me have a little bit. <laughs> Looks really pretty, don't it? Mush. Are you joking? <laughs> no, no. Let's take a photo of it. I mushed it. Mush. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's angry. He, he's seriously angry about what happened to his food. And I can imagine that one. Just in the moment of snapping that great picture, and then this happens. All right. Uh, millennials and Generation Z, especially millennials, uh, like to travel the world. Uh, so that food experience and food tourism is here to stay. And they, because they will keep on doing this when there is a vaccine or a medicine for COVID-19. As I, as I told you, I work a lot uh, with millennials and food traveling is their paramount experience. They save money to do that. Uh, for example, in, in these are two of my colleagues who, who went on a food tour uh, through Vietnam after saving money for a couple of years. Or they go to Oslo of Copenhagen, they visit the restaurants and share their stories and talk about food and how it's made and where it's from. And, and you know, it, it's so meaningful uh, for those younger people. That's incredible. And they bring back uh, at home all the text, uh, taste and textures of the world. So they embrace a kind of, yeah, you call it a nomadic cuisine. Eh? They are open for new experiences. Love to taste out the traditional pox of their national food culture. Eh? So they're open for experiments. And that's interesting. You could say those new generations, and this is a great picture. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Those new generations face with enormous challenges when it comes to balance, economy and ecology, they are redefining luxury. It's all about collecting memories instead of collecting stuff. Well, I'm all in for that. Collecting great memories is also my cup of tea. And uh, that's why I'm in love with hotels and restaurants and bar. I love to do my job. Uh, it's my conversational currency, in fact. So I, I want to share you uh, one of my great memories. That's an interesting one. Uh, it, it, it has, it, it's about building a great memory as, as, a, as an offer, you know, in a hotel. You know, you probably visited a lot of hotels too, as I did. So you, you, you don't remember all the hotel rooms you've ever been to, of course. You just remember a couple of them because they were special. And this one, I remember. This is the Ace Hotel in New York where I was a couple of years ago. And when you look at hotels, it's very well designed, modest. Uh, not luxurious, but luxurious in a different way. But what's there on that room that, that, that uh, was very special for me, it was this one. 
this guitar, guitar. And I happen to play a little bit of guitar. So I am in New York. I see that guitar and I immediately felt myself, Lou Reed, who had to sing a song on that guitar. And, 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 and this is what happened on, on, on the video. Look at this. It's been a lonely time In New York. Yeah, that's me playing uh, the guitar. Well, it's on uh, YouTube and I have 25 views already, so I need some help from you guys. It's not my career, probably, uh, music, but it's still a great memory. And that's what I was trying to show to you. Uh, do something which is not expected and, and, and you turn up with an everlasting memory for a lifetime. And that's me being Lou Reed at the hotel room in uh, New York. Okay, this is the last slides. I'm going to end up, uh, round up my, uh, my uh, presentations. Uh, and the last one uh, the, the, on the top layer is, is about reconnecting people. Uh, a restaurant in our view is not only about filling a stomach, but it's feeding souls, as we say. It's a place where the most vulnerable of human qualities is nurtured, and that's empathy. According to the steps of our pyramid, we are now at the highest meaning of uh, food, and that is to reconnect. We are repairing the broken connections between food, producers, uh, nature seasons, and each other. And perhaps countries with strong food cultures, like uh, Italy or France or Spain or Japan, already uh, possess a powerful, um, powerful sense of, of, of sharing and caring through food as a community, rather than the more individual oriented diner cultures like, like America, for example. And perhaps those poorer countries need to evolve. Eh? Anyhow, the ultimate food experience where you, where you want to reconnect with life, with, with culture, with, with optimism, with laughter, with emotion, and we're sure that's that's so essential for, for, for humans that that's one to stay. That's one to stay. So that's why we think terroir eh, is, is, is a big thing, which will grow, has a big future, a sense of place and time in the menu, not a global fabricated universal taste. And we see a whole new generation of chefs exploring the idea of floss, floss, F-L-O-S-S. -S. Can we have a menu that is fresh, local, organic, seasonal, and sustainable. Uh, and botanical gastronomy, for example, is an area which will get a, a lot of attention the upcoming uh, decade. And this is what we do. We organize our own festival, which is called uh, Food Unplugged, a food uh, festival for uh, professionals in food, uh, with small producers and community tables and, and uh, improvisational cooking and classes and workshops. And back to the roots, back to nature, but just, you know, to reconnect with people and, and nature again. So, and these are the people, my colleagues who are uh, doing uh, the jobs. And this is the picture of us having a great time, a great time. All right, I'm getting to the end of my presentation. And you look at the picture of uh, Monsieur Javier Wong. Uh, I'm certain you have your own uh, legendary uh, food moments uh, in life. And this, this one... Is one of mine, and he's a famous chef uh, in Peru. Perhaps you heard of him. Uh, we had a great interview with him, and he's cooking very honest and modest. But he's also the king of the ceviche, the national dish in uh, Peru. And uh, he told us something very special. Uh, the interview took an hour, but we just used two minutes of it. In, and it's a video of two minutes with a powerful, emotional, emotional message because it's the message between a chef a guest and the food. And what connects it all is taste and emotion. Let's look at the video. Cuando iba a comenzar a trabajar, sufro una llamada telefónica 
y mi hija acababa de fallecer. Pero como todo artista, como toda persona responsable, tengo que terminar mi trabajo. Comencé a preparar el ceviche, lo servimos y como un clip, ¡chac! un silencio bárbaro. Nadie hablaba y se sentía una tristeza generalizada. Nadie sabía nada, solamente yo. Sí se transmite, sí se transmite al menos en la comida, sí se transmite, eso es verdad. Eso me ha sucedido. Por eso que cuando estoy yo de mal humor o X situación que yo soy, prefiero disculparme y no cocinar. Porque yo no tengo ningún derecho de arruinarle el almuerzo a un cliente. Reconnect. All right. Well, this is it from uh, Ede Wageningen, Wageningen, eh, Ede, the, the middle of Holland. Um, perhaps there's a lot of, uh, lot of information uh, to take in, but um, I hope you enjoyed uh, uh, our insights and our inspiration. I, I love doing this. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We will do as we did yesterday, a virtual round of applause. I don't know if Hans sees the the hands of everyone. Thank you very much, Hans, for this very inspiring presentation. Um, so I'm getting some positive comments on the chat. What I will do is that I will take the four people who have just uh, written on the chat and I will actually hand them the words to you directly. So we will start with Mariangela, Mariangela from Torino, uh, can you maybe ask your question directly to Hans? We have uh, 15 minutes, so let's try to keep the questions short, but it's better that you can ask them directly. Okay, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, how can we combine the um, desire of chef to come back to terroir and the um, and the new generation uh, that um, are searching for new experiences, new kind of food. So um, it's a little bit strange to come back to local, but at the same time to find other experience. So I, I just want to know how to combine it also from a touristic point of view. Yeah. I don't know well if I... I yeah, yeah well, 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 I think what people are more and more looking for, let's say, uh, not every tourist, of course, but uh, a more and more important part of uh, the tourists are, are, are looking for a sense of place and time. So, uh, and also in the restaurant experience. So they like to, uh, let's say, uh, you got on the one end, you got all the fast food, international fast food chains. But on the other hand of the spectrum, food spectrum, is there a, 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 a little restaurant which serves local food, which people of the city uh, do like, eh, with uh, re sourcing their, their products from the region they're living in. Eh? And uh, I think that's a great combination, especially for travelers, because more and more travelers are, are also uh, choosing their destination because of food reasons. So not only uh, the architecture of the city or uh, museums or, or, or arts, but also the food experience. So, and that food experience has to be uh, tasty, of course, but also interesting, a story you want to share. And, and so the storytelling, and, 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 and that's really a message also to all you guys, because you are also in storytelling. The storytelling behind those restaurants and behind those products is, is, is really, really important to do, that, uh, to do that in a good way, in an attractive way, uh, because it makes you unique 
and it preserves and when it is successful the whole ecosystem behind restaurants and these are the small producers and the small farmers which are so important for taste and and and, and the quality of a region and which are under pressure right now because of COVID-19 and it's not only the restaurants it's also the producers who deliver to their goods to the restaurants which are in in, in deep trouble so uh, I think there's no uh, uh, contradiction in that one so when people travel um, which is not, uh, you know, perhaps sustainable, especially when you fly. So that's one thing we have to solve in the near future. But when you travel, you're looking for local food experiences. Okay. Thank you so much. It's you're interesting welcome. because Mariangela uh, wrote a comment in the chat when you showed the photos of the young millennials with their, you know, the naked young people with their food. And she said, where where are these kids not in my house? <laughs> and, uh, and you mentioned this question of culture. So maybe food culture is harder to change in some, in some places. And maybe the young people in Italy are definitely not looking for homemade, good, healthy food because they've always been, always been raised by it. But they're looking for the um, more modern, hardcore, heart attack grill food. So. Um, so it goes, it goes along with what, uh, what you just said. Um, I will now give the word to Felipe Garcia from Tucson in the US. He's Hello, hands. About his experience at the heart attack grill, maybe? Oh, God, no. Thank, I haven't been there, thank God. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting, hands to see that you have a, a Coca-Cola that it's imported from Mexico. The US is bringing Coca-Cola from Mexico because it's healthier, because they're using sugar rather than, than uh, corn syrup. Uh, my question I wanted to ask to you was social media, internet, what, how is it affecting all these? I'm a little, I mean, it, it's funny to see people flood restaurants because they're on TripAdvisor and Yelp, and they go in having no idea, but they just want to have a picture in the place that has the most TripAdvisor uh, ratings. And also you see chefs using food as a show. I see chefs that are taking a piece of meat and slapping them and throwing them and, and people are fascinated and taking videos. So all of a sudden I feel that there's this trend of, of food as a show rather than putting into this pyramid. And to be honest, to me, it's a little bit upsetting. Uh, any take on that social media influence into the food scene? Well, I, I can agree on that one, what, what you see. As I said, food is on the, on, on the catwalk. So that means... <laughs> A lot of people who want to be on the catwalk uh, act in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way, and that's that's perhaps a showy way, where the, where, 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 which they do to to make an impression. Um, there's of course an overload, a sea of uh, in, uh, information, um, and you've got just you know a few seconds of uh, attention for every, everybody who is using uh, social media. So. Uh, I, I don't. I do not agree with uh, with that. It's not something I like, but uh, it, it's the reality we're faced with, and, um, and and you can say, well, as a restaurateur or a chef, I don't want to be a part of it. That's also cool. If you, you know, I know also restaurateurs who say I, I, I want to bring my story alive in a different way, and I focus just on the customers uh, who are coming in in my restaurant, and the word of mouth of the old days is still good enough for me. Uh, but on the other hand, you've got a lot of uh, chefs and young chefs who say, well, yeah, social media, that's my uh, uh, gateway to, uh, to the catwalk of, uh, of food. And I have to use that one in, in a good way. Um, I think, you know, you've got a feeling perhaps, uh, as I have, about authenticity, uh, which we, we, we think is important for food and is the message in social media then, which is uh, uh, said and which is uh, told is that, is, is that authentic? Well, perhaps there's a, a kind of tension between what we feel and like and, and, and what reality is. So, uh, uh, well, these are my, my thoughts, uh, but, but all the social media, they're, they're here to stay. And uh, it, uh, that's why it's more important, the first thing I say, to, to deliver the true stories, the, the, the true stories in text or in videos behind the products, on, on perhaps on the city uh, uh, you represent. But it's interesting to see that your final video of that per Peruvian chef, which is absolutely amazing, that could be a very retweeted, reshared video on social media. So, so social media is also 
just here to represent what people want and they want that authenticity. Yeah. Um, and, and it could definitely just be, it's reality, but it could be an ad uh, that you see on social media. Yeah. Um, we're talking about authenticity. I'll leave the word to Olivier from Brussels, who also had a comment on that topic. Thank you, Camille. Um, in eerste instantie wil ik u bedanken voor uw presentatie. Ik vond het geweldig, zeer inspirerend. Uh, dus dank u wel uh, vanuit Brussel. So I'll switch back to English, sorry. Um, well, the question I was about to ask was, was very similar to the one Mariangela uh, raised. So I will slightly adapt it. And, and um, as you maybe know, Brussels is about 40% local cuisine, Belgian, French cuisine, and 60% uh, world cuisine. Uh, on the restaurant scene. And um, if I look at that offer on world cuisine, um, the first step was the arrival of that uh, world cuisine after World War II and in the 50s. And the, 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 the chefs uh, were adapting their, their local cuisine to, 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 to the locals. Like you, you would have Chinese cuisine, the European way, Italian cuisine, the Belgian way, et cetera, et cetera. And the second step, uh, that occurred like in, in, in the beginning of the 21st century was uh, developing an authentic offer because people were traveling a lot more. They were asking uh, really to, to, to find back what they had tasted uh, when, when abroad, when traveling. And I see now the emergence of a kind of third step where because of the circular uh, economy and the locality of the products, etc., I see this authentic world cuisine slightly adapting to the local products but still remaining authentic do you think that's going to be a growing trend in the future i don't know if i'm clear in my question yeah yeah i think because people are also uh, used uh, to to uh, world cuisine as you as you call it uh, how can you combine that with the trend of localization and can you use local ingredients which have uh, uh, for, for those dishes, which are represented in a world cuisine. I think so too, yeah, that's what we see. So we see a lot of chefs who are uh, turning into more and more into local, but serve you know, classic dishes in a new way. Uh, and, and that's a very interesting one. I think that, and, uh, that's one to stay. And uh, we, I, I just had an interview with uh, the, the, the head inspector of Michelin uh, last week. Um, we talked about COVID-19 and all the challenges uh, there are. And he said we had to focus on launch and other things. Uh, but one of the other things he said, well, it's, uh, it's very important that chefs focus on that local transition and that they keep doing that. And you can, of course, have classic dishes with local ingredients. I think that's, uh, that's an interesting future. Yeah. And okay. thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the, 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 our guest uh, did talk in, in Dutch a little bit and you know, and, 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 I, and I'm not exaggerated, but he said it was a fantastic presentation. So uh... that's right. <laughs> Confirm it. Yeah, well, Mariangela, don't listen to it, but I, I would just like to give an example. One of my favorite Italian restaurants in Brussels is uh, offering a parmigiana, traditional parmigiana in, in the summertime. But in the winter, they consider that aubergine is, is not the right product, so they replace the aubergine with, with local uh, products. Uh, and this is one of my favorite dishes at that restaurant. Yeah. But to me, it's, it's still authentic cuisine. Yeah, agree. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have one more minute. So one more question uh, from Gabriella, uh, who is based in Frankfurt. Gabriella, you, you have Germany. the word. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. So I had just one question about the impact of COVID-19. Do you think that uh, concerning the food system, it will help us to, to go toward, towards more sustainable and healthier food system or the contrary? What is, is it a positive impact or more negative? No, well, well, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in one minute, COVID-19 is, uh, the impact is that, that uh, let's say the big issues we talked about, the transition to, uh, to a more sustainable and healthy food system, more sustainable and healthy menus is a little bit under pressure because people in crisis, you know, and who, who, who have a feelings of anxiety, they often make uh, the wrong food choices. They go for uh, comfort food in, 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 in critical times. So that's something uh, we have to be aware of. But when COVID-19 is gone, the big issues I talked about will reoccur in a massive, massive way. 
and 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 you know the the food uh, system, uh, the food space is is very uh, important in solving all those issues. So we better be prepared for the discussion which is is showing up after COVID nineteen. We better be prepared because everybody is going to be holding accountable for our choices we make. So also uh, everybody who's in the, the great area of food city uh, marketing. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Hans. I will send you by email all the very positive comments uh, that are on the chat, but I think everyone was fascinated by your um, presentation and Neil thought it was provoking also, inspiring. Uh, so I'll send all of that to you. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was a, a great overview of where we're heading as food cities. It's um, important for the Diddy's members to, as you have a vision of what's coming next so that they can better support their uh, food industry in this rough moment. So thank you very much, Hans, and to all of your team for setting this up in such a beautiful studio. Um, best of luck for your future adventures. Thank you very much to everyone and a special thank you to you, Hans. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye from the Netherlands. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hans.